and welcome to the Betsy and Walter Stern Conference Center here at Hudson Institute. I'm Ken Weinstein, President and CEO of Hudson Institute. Hudson was founded 51 years ago as a forward-looking policy research organization designed to think creatively about how to achieve a better future in the face of the then unprecedented challenges of the early 1960s. Though the world has changed in significant ways since those days, our fundamental ways of looking at the world have not. Since the founding days of Hudson Institute, our work has been shaped in part by the belief that the dedicated efforts of a few determined individuals can make a significant difference in the fight for freedom and human rights. And the book that we will be discussing today, Escape from North Korea, the untold story of Asia's Underground Railroad, embodies this concept. This highly anticipated volume by Hudson Institute senior fellow Melanie Kirkpatrick has just been published by Encounter Books. And I must say that uh, Melanie offers both a very moving and a very analytic account of the experiences of North Koreans who risk their lives to escape the world's worst tyranny, as well as the network of for-profit smugglers and humanitarian groups, primarily dedicated Christian missionaries and Korean Americans who help them. Escape from North Korea also offers an original examination of the political climate of North Korea and recommends policies that may help bring down the totalitarian regime that rules Pyongyang. The book, which has already received very favorable reviews in Publishers Weekly, The Wall Street Journal, and The Weekly Standard, as well as in the uh, South Korean press, is available for purchase at the discounted price of $20 after the event. And I urge all of you to, uh, to get a copy of the book. Melanie Kirkpatrick herself is a frequent contributor to many prominent publications, including the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, for which she worked from 1980 to 2009. At the Wall Street Journal, she was deputy editor of the Mighty Editorial Page <laughs> from 2006 to 2009, and a longtime member of the editorial board. And so she undoubtedly played a key role in shaping of the thinking of many of us uh, in this room. As deputy editor, she was responsible for the editorial page's coverage of international issues and oversaw the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal in Asia and in Europe, the Far Eastern Economic Review, as well as U.S. columnists on foreign affairs. My colleagues and I at Hudson are deeply proud to claim her as a colleague, and we look forward to her comments uh, today as well. We're also very pleased to welcome uh, Professor J. Ku, the uh, director of the U.S. Korea Institute at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, as well as Greg Scarlaccio, the Executive Director of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. We will also be hearing uh, as well from Suzanne Schulte, Chair of the North Korea Freedom Coalition, as well as uh, Kim Seung Min, North Korean defector and the founder of Free North Korea Radio, both of whom are coming to us uh, from a meeting on Capitol Hill and have been delayed a few minutes. And we look forward to a compelling discussion between these experts Lastly, let me remind you once again that uh, copies of Escape from North Korea will be available for sale in our lobby at the discounted price of $20, and Melanie Kirkpatrick has graciously agreed to sign copies. I urge all of you to read it, discuss it, and read it again. And now let me turn it over to, our, uh, to Melanie Kirkpatrick. Right. Oh. Okay, I'll start. Um, thank you all for being here today, and uh, thank you, Ken, for that very warm introduction. Um, I found a very congenial intellectual home here at the Hudson Institute, and I'd like to express my especially, especially warm thanks to two senior fellows. One is Michael Horowitz, um, who I don't think is here today, but uh, who is a very compassionate and long-term observer of uh, human rights in North Korea. I thank him for his uh, advice. And uh, the other senior fellow I'd like to thank is Jack David, whom um, some of you may know has a second job as my husband, <laughs> a more challenging one perhaps. <laughs> um, but Jack was my first reader and I must say my toughest critic, and I thank him very much. I'm also very grateful to Greg and Jay for being here today and uh, agreeing to uh, discuss my book and to Suzanne and uh, Kim Sung Ming, who I hope will be here very shortly. I thought I would begin by mentioning the exact moment that I became aware of the suffering of the North Korean people. That was in 1981, 
and I was the op-ed editor of the Asian Wall Street Journal in Hong Kong. Uh, one morning I went to the office and there was a submission that crossed my desk from a journalist in um, working in Peking, as we called it then, um, who was Italian. And he had achieved the rare feat of obtaining a visa to Pyongyang. And he'd written an article about it for his magazine and he sent me a, a translation of it hoping that it would be published in the Asian Wall Street Journal. I published it, and it was an eye-opening article for me, especially his descriptions of the um, Kim family worship in, Kyongya in uh, Pyongyang. For me, it was like reading a chapter of 19, uh, 1984. George Orwell's dystopian vision had come to life in North Korea a few years early. I, but, and I couldn't get the closing line out of my head, and I'll, I'll quote it here. He wrote, when I got off the plane in Peking, I kissed the ground, happy to be back in a free country. China, 1981, a free country? Um, I, kn I knew from personal experience that there was little freedom there. Was it really possible that North Korea could be worse? Thirty years later, we of course know the answer to that question. North Korea is the world's most repressive regime. Its people are slaves of the Kim family regime, which controls every aspect of their life, including whether or not you get to eat. Religion is banned. There's no rule of law. Perceived political infractions are met with harsh punishment, punishment that is meted out to three generations of an offender's family in many cases. If a man or a woman commits a political crime, he knows that he will, when he goes to jail, his parents and his children will go with him. Most awful, of, most awful of all, we know about the Gulag, where at least a million people have perished, and there are now 200,000 people um, languishing there at this very moment. The reason we know all of this, and more, is thanks to the testimonies of the people I write about in my book, those who have escaped from North Korea. This knowledge comes to us despite nearly 60 years of um, isolation and the best efforts of the Kim family regime to keep it secret. For more than 50 years, North Korea has been sealed off from the rest of the world. To give just one example of how the Kim family keeps information out of North Korea and keeps us from getting information, um, every radio, even a, in one's own home, is required to be registered with the security police. That is, you have to take your radio when you purchase it to the police station and register it. At the same time, you are not allowed to change the dial, which is fixed to North Korea's um, government radio station. To enforce this rule, security police equipped with scanners will cruise neighborhoods trying to find um, households that are tuning into illegal foreign radio broadcasts, people who've tinkered with their radios. Surveys of North Koreans who've escaped to China and elsewhere show that a very high percentage of them had listened to these foreign radio broadcasts before they left North Korea. And their motivation to leave was at least in part informed by uh, what they heard on those broadcasts and their knowledge of the opportunities outside their borders. I think it reinforces the idea that people in North Korea really are hungry for information. And I see people standing in the back. There's room in the front if you'd like to sit down. Please join us. Um, as many of you know, North Koreans who decide to escape um, must first go to China. You can't go south to the DMZ, even though it is called the demilitarized zone. It's the world's most militarized border, and nobody can go across it or without guidance. In China, the policy is to track down North Korean refugees, arrest them, and send them back to North Korea. This policy is both, both immoral and it's in contravention of China's obligations under the international <laughs> treaties it has signed. Some of the North Koreans in China, however, decide to risk a second escape. They get out of China. They want to go out of China to South Korea or, in some cases, other countries.
But no one can accomplish this feat on their own. They need help. And here's where the new Underground Railroad comes into play. Like the original Underground Railroad in the American South prior to the Civil War, the new Underground Railroad is a network of safe houses and transit routes across China. And the operators are both human traffickers, that is, those people who are in it for the money, and Christians whose religious beliefs impel them to help their brothers and sisters in North Korea. Also like the original Underground Railroad, um, where many of the operators were freed blacks, um, in China, many of the operators are ethnic Koreans. They are Korean Americans, or they are South Koreans, or in some cases they are also ethnic Koreans who have Chinese citizenship. Thanks to the Underground Railroad across China, an increasing number of North Koreans have reached safety in recent years. The numbers are quite startling. In 1990, a total of nine North Koreans got to South Korea. Nine. In not, ten years later, um, about a hundred got to South Korea. Last year, 2,737 North Koreans reached safety in South Korea. There's a total of about 24,000 North Koreans who are living in the South today. In addition to educating all of us about the truth of life in North Korea, the exiles are performing a second, perhaps even more important function. They are educating their countrymen. They are helping to open up their information-starved homeland. Just as the world today knows more about North Korea, North Koreans also know far more of the world. This is thanks in large part to the people who've escaped. How do they do this? It is impossible to make a phone call to North Korea or to send an email or a text message or even mail a letter. So the exiles have created a black market in information. They hire Chinese couriers to cross the border, knock on their relative's door, and hand deliver a message. Sometimes they send money, sometimes they send Chinese cell phones that they then ask the relative to use to receive a phone call from them. They capture the Chinese signal. Um, and in South Korea, um, North Korean exiles like Kim Sung Ming, who will be here shortly, um, have formed organizations to help transmit information to North Korea in a more systematic way. There are four radio stations now run by defectors, including Kim Sung Ming, that broadcast to North Korea. And there are other organizations that are using high-tech, often digital means to get information into North Korea. To give you just one very small example of that, um, I know of one group that uh, has video, has, excuse me, has DVDs on which it's put uh, South Korean soap operas and uh, other quote-unquote subversive information. And they drop, they get a Chinese courier to take that to a town in North Korea and just drop them off on a corner, hoping that somebody will pick them up, will steal them, and take it home and watch them. Because of all this, the mantra of the Kim family regime that South Korea, that North Korea is the greatest nation on earth is being exposed finally for the lie that it is. I'll point out that uh, Kim uh, Jong-un, the new dictator of South Korea, understands the power of information and the threat that it poses to his rule. One of his first acts after succeeding his father last December was to issue orders to uh, guards along the border to shoot to kill anybody who was trying to cross the border. There are also reports that he, have, he has performed other crackdowns on uh, the families of North Koreans who have escaped. He's very much trying to stop the information flow into North Korea. I'd like to close with a quote from a, a, a North Korean boy I interviewed. This is a boy who escaped to China when he was 13 years old. His family had all died or disappeared. He was, on a he was alone. He crossed the border. 
um, while he when he got to China, he was fortunate to run into a Chinese Christian who suggested that he look for help at a church. And his reply was, what's a church? And the person told him, look for a building with a cross on it. He did that, and he eventually got out of China with the help of an American aid organization, Liberty in North Korea. And um, I heard him address in English, I might add, um, a, a group of people uh, at uh, Liberty in North Korea. And he said to them, what you are doing changed my life, and it will eventually change North Korea. Today, thanks to the information from North Koreans who've escaped, it's no longer possible for anyone to plead ignorance about what's going on in North Korea. We know about the suffering of the North Korean people, the depredations of the totalitarian regime, and we can't argue that things really aren't so bad in that country. A free North Korea is not an impossible goal. With the help of the North Korean people themselves, those in exile, and those still locked in their prison state, we could make it happen. Melanie, thank you very much for your presentation and for a book that And for an extraordinary book that adds tremendously to the effort to bring more attention to the plight of North Korean refugees in China and beyond and to the human rights violations being perpetrated by the North Korean regime. I would also like to mention that Melanie's husband, Jack David, is also a board member of our committee, the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. And I would also like to acknowledge the co-chair of our committee, Dr. Roberta Cohen, who is present today, and uh, Mr. John Dupre, also a board member. For the past nine months since Kim Jong-il died, we have been faced with a charm offensive that a few days ago a North Korean scholar called a um, version of image first politics in North Korea. I've certainly seen the first lady of, young first lady of North Korea being paraded before TV cameras. We've seen Mickey Mouse and we, uh, we um, have seen uh, defectors and um, former Japanese chefs of Kim Jong-il being apparently magnanimously forgiven by the dear young leader of North Korea. From our viewpoint as human rights organizations, what we can say is that we have seen no evidence that the human rights situation in North Korea North Korea has improved. And Melanie's work and Melanie's book helps everyone remember the terrible plight of North Korean refugees trying to escape an extraordinarily oppressive regime. This book helps us remember that they face forcible repatriation by China in violation of the 1951 Refugee Convention, forcible repatriation that often results in extraordinarily cruel punishment, imprisonment in North Korea's cruel political prison camps where between 150 and 200,000 people are still being imprisoned. I would now like to turn the floor over to um, uh, our discussant, uh, Dr. Che Gu, who is um, the director of the U.S. Korea Institute at uh, John Hopkins Sice. He is also a professional lecturer. He was uh, a director of human rights for the North Korea Project at Freedom House. He has taught at Brown University, Yonsei University, and also at uh, Sungmyong Women's University in Seoul. He uh, is a recipient of Fulbright and Freeman Fellowships. He has conducted research at various think tanks, including the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the Korean Institute of International Studies in Seoul, and the Institute for International Relations in Hanoi. He uh, holds a um, PhD in international relations from SAIS. Dr. Che Gu has asked me to keep his introduction short, <laughs> although there's so much to say about him. Um, Dr. Ku, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Greg. Um, thank you, Hudson uh, Institute, for hosting this event. And thank you, Melanie, for writing a wonderful book, a much needed book. Um, once Suzanne and, 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 and Kim Sung Min get here, uh, it will be a sort of a reunion for me. Um, before I uh, went back to uh, Johns Hopkins, I uh, ran the North Korea Human Rights Project at Freedom House. I was the first and only director um, under the, the uh, 2004 North Korea Human Rights Act uh, to, uh, to uh, have a, a project at Freedom House to work for um, human rights advocacy there. I think if you're going to read one book on North Korea this year, I think this is it. Um, Melanie has written a a very readable book. 
a very readable but a critical account of what is really happening uh, in North Korea now and what has happened in North Korea in the past two decades. I think the book's contribution is twofold. It is for people like me who cover Korean issues every day, um, not always about North Korea, not always about human rights, but to get a better understanding of what North Korea is undergoing, uh, why we have 20 to 25,000 North Korean defectors in Korea, South Korea at all, why, how did at some point 300,000 or even 500,000 North Koreans living in China but only 20, 25,000 end up in South Korea. And she really delves into the kind of problems that these defectors have in North Korea. Too often in this town, we kind of see these issues in bigger picture. Yes, they're being repatriated from, uh, by China. Yes, they're trafficked. But we don't really understand the kind of the stories behind these statistics. And I think that's her contribution. And it's also a contribution, I, I would think, for many of you who know something about North Korea, and you've read the articles in the newspapers, seen the news um, uh, events, the goose-stepping North Korean soldiers in the, uh, uh, the square, uh, their, their pursuit of nuclear weapons but not really fully grasping what's happening internally in North Korea and, and how that's affecting uh, the relations with the outside world. And so I think the second fold, it, it's a useful book to provide the kind of the general information for people who don't cover or really know a whole lot about North Korea. Before I go further into commenting about this book, I should say what this book is not about, and I'm very glad it's not about this. It's not about how North Korea got the bomb or why he got the bomb, or the tedious negotiations behind trying to get the North Korea to denuclearize a uh, series, uh, series that has yet to uh, bear any fruit uh, uh, conclusion. But it is a com comprehensive treatment of how North Korean citizens flee and the people who really help them. And she humanizes these individuals of, by weaving their personal stories and weaving the personal stories of the people who help them get out. And as she does this, in doing so, she, she really touches very seriously about the issues that we deal with North Korea every day, the recurring famine, um, the, the cruelty, the inability of the regime to feed itself and its treatment of its own citizens, and also the biggest problem facing defectors as they leave, escape North Korea, is how do they endure and survive in China? What kind of obstacles are they going through? In the human rights community, we often talk about Korean, North Korean women who get to Seoul, and they say the price to pay, and it's somehow recognized and accepted that this is the minimal payment, this is the price you have to pay to get freedom, which is you have to be trafficked. And not enough of us in this audience or in elsewhere really understand that that's the price for those women who've made it out. And as they begin to get maybe their daughter or their sisters, they recognize that that's the experience that they too must undergo. And, and, and I think what, what Melanie does is to capture that horrifying story behind all of these people. Too often we get caught up in numbers. In this town, you know, we, we, you know I've sat on many of these panels discussing whether is it, is it 500,000 who died from famine? Is it a million? Is it two million? Is it 300,000 North Koreans in China or 500,000? And as we discuss these statistics, we really lose sight of the, the individuals behind these figures. I mean, if you were North Korean and you somehow witnessed your father, mother, siblings starve to death, can't find the next meal, not for the next day or two, but months at a time, and you've been conditioned to live in that totalitarian state and somehow you find the courage to somehow say, I cannot live here. 
and you make that bold, courageous move to cross that border, and you don't have the, the, the world life knowledge about use of currency or foreign language or how to live in a foreign society. And so every time you cross, you cross into a border, you're not sure if the, the border guards will require a bribe payment or will shoot you. And if you find someone who can help, as, as Melanie writes about this young man who looked for a cross, how do you trust that person? And as Melanie documents how they go from one underground railroad station to the next, you're really reliving that insecurity, that fear. Is this person going to sell me out? How do I trust this person? And this process gets replayed every time you cross a border. Unless you somehow manage to find or buy a fake passport, maybe get on a flight to Seoul directly from Beijing or elsewhere, you really have to make at least two border crossings into China, into Mongolia maybe, into Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Myanmar. So at some point, you might be making border crossings of three, four countries. And what kind of emotions do they go through? Once they go through this human, this tragic hell, really hell on earth, they somehow make it to South Korea. <coughs> Few of them, I think maybe a hundred, hundred, maybe 10, 15 more have made it to the United States. They're the lucky ones, and yet they have to go through the guilt of putting their loved ones in vulnerable position in North Korea, in which regime will probably have made some kind of uh, committed retribution against the family. Or even the guilt of, how come I survived? How did I make it when my sister didn't? Or how did I make it when my friend did not? And I'm going to conclude with the, the one of the lucky stories um, that uh, Melanie mentioned. Uh, this young man, young man now, but he was a boy of, of 13 when he crossed the border. Um, I got to know him because soon as he came and was, uh, I think, settled in Richmond, um, my friend who um, was with the, uh, the organization, American Aid Organization, brought him, and I was teaching a class on North Korea human rights. And he came and he spoke about what his existence was like, how he hid out in China, how he um, um, you know, scrounged for food, begged for food, stole food, and how he managed with the help of an American uh, organization. Organization. Now, when, it's, when you think of American organization, you think of people like you know, us, you know, late, mid, 40s, 50s, you know. You know, these were really college kids. Kids who, I mean, they were really kids. They were young, idealistic, bright, 20, early 20-something 20 kids who went out there and said after college, I want to make a difference. And they were able to get at least this young boy out, and, and he came to my class. And he's telling uh, my class how every day he would get up and start reading. And he would read literally several books a day because he would read until nightfall. And my friend says, ask him what he has in his pocket. And I said, why? He said, because he had strawberries this morning and I think he still has some in his pocket. And here's a guy, young, um, vibrant, energetic, optimistic. And I think his story is a testament to what North Korean defectors have experienced and hopefully are enjoying their lives um, in South Korea and elsewhere. Thank you very much. Dr. Ku, thank you very much. Uh, we are now being joined by Suzanne Schulte and Kim Song Min, our two other discussants. Our greatest challenges are that it's always hard to maintain North Korea at the top of the agenda, and it's particularly hard to maintain human rights at the top of the agenda.